Welcome to the Thriving Farmer Podcast. I'm your host, Michael Kilpatrick. Our mission is to inspire, educate, and celebrate sustainable farming. We believe that you can build a profitable, sustainable farm that gives you true farm freedom. Join us as we talk to farmers, innovators, educators, and entrepreneurs to glean their top takeaways in business and life. Hey, Thriving Farmers, Michael Kilpatrick here with yet another episode of the Thriving Farmer podcast. And today's guests are Lindsay of Whistlepig Farm and Joe of Black Fox Farm. These first-generation farmers are growing on shared farmland in Boise, Idaho. Although they run separate farm businesses, Lindsay and Joe work together on a collaborative CSA, invest in shared infrastructure, and manage joint perennial crops. Lindsay and Joe, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having us. Yeah, so Lindsay, why don't you give us a little bit of background about how you got into farming? Yeah, so this is my seventh year farming um, here in Boise, but I actually started farming in Albuquerque, New Mexico. I did an incubator farm training program for a year called um, Grow the Growers. That's through the Bernalillo County. And... (laughs) So it was like a year-long program. They put a group of farmers on some land for hands-on education and then did some like business education and some working on other farms in the area. Um, and so after that, I ended up moving up to Idaho with my partner and just kind of dove into farm ownership from there. Mm-hmm. And what was the traction to Boise? Um, you know... I couldn't even told, picked it out on a map when I moved here, but it came for my partner's job. Okay, gotcha. All right. And then, Joe, what's your background? Uh, yeah, so I'm born and raised here in Boise. I've uh, been doing this about six years. Uh, I just decided I always wanted to do agriculture and kind of came across jm 48s book and read it and inspired me to start a farm and That's kind of where it's gone since then. I didn't do much training or anything, just kind of self-taught, still learning, obviously, as always, which I like. Awesome. Okay, so then, and what does each of your farms focus on? So we're both doing mixed vegetables, but we kind of focus a little bit in different areas. Um, So since we do the CSA together and we don't want to have a ton of overlap, um, Joe does a lot more of like the salad mm-hmm. greens and the greenhouse tomatoes and cucumbers. And I've kind of focused a little bit more on the field crops um, to go through the CSA. And then for the farmer's market, I do more Asian vegetables. Okay. And then um, how much uh, space are you each growing on? Uh, I guess production-wise, I'm probably three-quarters of an acre maybe like two thirds. Um, and then we have another we have quarter about, acre in perennials, maybe. Not yeah. Acre. We have about seven acres least total though on the whole deal. Okay. And how did you find the land that you lease? Uh, I found it through another farmer that was on the land at the time. So there used to be a couple other farms there. They've come and gone. Um, just made a relationship with the landowner and been there for, I guess, five years now yeah we both actually started on <laughs> different pieces of land um and then joe moved to this current property a year before i did and then i came after it's a 60 ish acre parcel and it used to um, have a vegetable farm that was using pretty much all of that space and then they left um mm. a few years before we came on and then there's sort of been some different rotating farmers in and out and we've we've become the mainstays. Yeah. Well, it, it seems a lot to move a, a 60 acre vegetable farm. Yes. They had an opportunity to buy some land um, a little bit further out. And gotcha. so now that farm has a whole setup going. They've got a farm to table restaurant and wine tasting room and then their farm. Um, but yeah, it definitely was oh, a big cool. endeavor for them. Yeah. Um, so then talk a little bit about kind of like the infrastructure on the farm. What's the soil like? Uh, it's like a silty loam. We have no rocks, which is pretty unbelievable for the Treasure Valley. And it's a super deep topsoil. Um, yeah. We have really That's great nice. quality soil. 
the biggest problem is probably compaction from yeah. years of dry farming and equipment and stuff like that over yeah. it. And then just the accumulated weed pressure of years of farming with mm-hmm. some, some gaps in there where the weeds can kind of go rough wild. Um, but yeah, when we came onto the land, there was a little bit of infrastructure. So we have a groundwater well and there was, you know, some piping underground, bringing that to a few different places. And there was electrical and there was a concrete pad. Um, and so that was sort of what we started with and we've been building up from there. Very cool. And so what does your infrastructure look like now? Uh, now we have a pack shed, which luckily we built before the pandemic when things were affordable. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and we just built it around the concrete pad where we put the cooler since it's already okay. there. It may not be yeah. like the most uh, Pretty. <laughs> I- idealistic spot to put it based on like walking, but it works. Uh, yeah. And we've added some irrigation infrastructure. Mm-hmm. Joe has put in quite a few more hydrants. And then with our landowner's help, we extended some irrigation into new areas last year. Um, and that's sort of been a challenge with the irrigation because we don't 100% know what we're working with um, in terms of what's underground and where it's all going. Gotcha. So it's kind of like a, a treasure hunt. A yeah, little yeah. bit. A little bit, yeah. But we had upgraded the pump a few years ago. Uh, we put an elk fence in elk fence. 2022. Um, that's an yeah. electric piece. Uh, so what does an elk fence look like? It's basically T-posts with three lines of wire, electrical wire. And here we have uh, fishing game, actually. Uh, part of the deal is that with... Uh, crops being destroyed by animals they paid for our charger mm. and we just had to build the rest of the fence and we actually okay. have a herb we're in a unique spot because the county dump is like a few miles up the hill from us so there's about 70 okay. elk that never leave this area so oh so they're, they're going after the dump yeah so they kind of funnel between the dump and we have other foothills behind us so they kind of go back and forth all year Yes, the dump is just effectively okay, so it's, a wild area. Oh, okay, I gotcha. Okay, so it's just more habitat for them. It's not like they're snacking on the, the yeah, candy bars yeah. that end up in the dump. Okay, <laughs> that would have been a little interesting. Um, yeah. So the okay, so three wire electric fence. Is this all on basically? Because we do three D fences here for deer. Uh, this sounds like it's more just one upright setup. Yep, and not as tall as you'd build for deer. The elk aren't as much of jumpers. They're more of a brute force attack. Um, Ah, okay. So as long as you can slow them down enough to, yeah, to taste that or smell the the little uh, apple scent, then Uh you're good to go. Yeah, the idea is to kind of get them to come up to it close and just hit it with their nose. Mm -hmm. We put ribbons and stuff like flagging tape on it. To kind of catch yeah. their eye, but if they put their head over it and then they get shocked, they'll just run through it. Yes, yeah. which happens yeah, sometimes. Absolutely. Okay, so you do have elk in the uh, in the crops there. W- talk a little bit about your season. So, like uh, Idaho's a bit chilly. It's well, it's a bit chilly and a bit super hot. So our season's pretty short and intense. Um, we're what like. 100 days frost free or somewhere around there, 110. Um, So we have a pretty short, windy spring that leads into a super hot, dry summer. And then usually a pretty nice fall and the winters are mild. Um, So this time of year, we're getting our first hard freezes and, you know, snow could happen anytime, but we don't get a ton of snowfall. Gotcha. Okay. And uh, okay, go ahead. I was going to say, and I think this year it was 27 days past for frost this year. So things seem to be warming up every year here. So Yes. No, we see that uh, ourselves, a significant aspect of that. Yeah. Um, okay. So water, you've got um, hydrants and stuff. Where is the water on shares or is that on a well? It's on a groundwater well. Yeah. And we don't really get any rainfall between... June and October, um, okay. so we are very reliant on our well water. And that's sufficient for both your farms? 
It is, yes. but um, just the amount of flow we can get at a time can be challenging. We definitely have to coordinate um, our watering schedules to make sure everyone's getting what they need because if we're all trying to run at the same time, it's just not going to work. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay, so it's pretty low flow. Um, back to these perennial crops. Talk a little bit more about those and uh, those mainly for your CSA or... Yeah, they're mainly for the CSA. We were lucky to inherit some from the previous farm tenants. Um, so when we came on the land, there were blackberries, currants, and some rhubarb. Um, and we put in asparagus, and we've been putting in more rhubarb, and we'd like to expand the berries as well. Yeah. So asparagus is something we're looking at. Um, how do you manage that? Oh, not too well so far, to be honest with you. <laughs> Keep it, okay. We put it in an area that was sort of neglected. and um, We kind of did it, like, quickly. We didn't really put a lot of thought when we decided to do it, so we just did it. Mm. <laughs> and gotcha. we're about two years in, so next year we should have something. But yeah, we got to figure out our plan for managing weeds between the rows, um, especially as we get into the production, so probably going to invest in some landscape fabric. Yeah. So uh, with uh, asparagus, that is the biggest challenge is the weeds. Um, and do you guys have asparagus beetle out there too? Not that I've seen. I've managed some other asparagus in the area and haven't had any asparagus beetle. Okay. Okay. All right. So maybe you're too cold. Again, I'm not a huge expert on any of those. So, uh, and then uh, blackberries, I'm assuming with your climate, those are thorny blackberries. They're actually thornless ones that were planted. Okay. Uh, by the previous farmers. Um, and those are usually, it's pretty short harvest. It's like August to maybe mid September and that's it. Uh-huh. But it's a really nice thing to have for the CSA. It's something other CS CSAs in the area don't have, so it's mm -hmm. a good differentiating factor. Yeah. Well, you guys are actually zone 6B, so you're actually slightly warmer than we are. Mm -hmm. So. Um, oh, yeah. Our winters yeah. are definitely much milder than northern Indiana. Okay. Yeah. So then talk a little bit about your season. Um, are you guys growing just during the summer growing season? Do you guys have any tunnels? Uh. I, I have tunnels. I basically can grow all year for the most part. Uh, I got, what do I have? 300 foot of those farmer friend tunnels. And I think a couple 50 footers. And like right now, I'm just basically growing spinach and lettuce in them for the winter. Yes. Uh, it kind of dies down here in January, but then it'll pick up in February again. And then. Uh, we just mostly use that too to keep the tomatoes covered because we always get a lot of hail storms. We get a lot of thunderstorms in the summer from the heat. Interesting. Hot okay. Yeah. So it just helps protect things because one storm destroys everything here. Yeah. And sun's fall yeah. is a big challenge in summer too because we have really high UV. Um, but yeah. I don't, I mostly just focus on the summer production. I have a couple of tunnels, but not to the extent that Joe has. And I, I personally really need that time off in the winter to balance it all out. Joe goes a little bit harder than I do. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so then back to the the, the season there. Okay, so you get um, the product that you grow during the winter. Does that go to your farmer's market? Uh, yeah, farmer's market. And then uh, we work with a third-party online website that does local deliveries for farms. Gotcha. So you're just producing for that as well then? Yeah, pretty much. All right. And um, let's talk a little bit about the the CSA you guys run. Talk a little bit about kind of how that is set up. Yeah, so it's pretty simple. We just each grow half the produce for each week, each aiming for, you know, a target dollar value. Um, and we just split the proceeds down the middle and we do some coordination in terms of like who's growing what there's obviously some overlap which is great like to have you know in years when a crop might not do well awesome to have your neighbor who has that crop as backup um 
we we didn't set out to be CSA farmers. We okay. Both st- we both separately started CSAs in 2020 when the farmers markets closed down, um, and there wasn't a clear timeline for reopening. And then after running them separately for a year, we figured it didn't make sense to duplicate that effort. Um, and so that's when we started doing the collaborative CSA in 2021. And that's honestly been great. It's much less stressful when you only have to grow three to five crops a week instead of all of them by yourself. Um, it also allows us to do more pickups because we can split mm-hmm. it. So that's another big plus. Gotcha. Okay. And uh, uh, so you each then have a vehicle you use for deliveries or? Yeah. Yeah, just our personal vehicles. Um, and then we do a couple different pickups and split who who nans them. So I man one in my neighborhood where I live, and then I drop off for our delivery shares. And then Joe runs a pickup out of the farm and another one in one of like the downtown adjacent neighborhoods in Boise. Okay. And then what would you say is the demographic of your customers? It definitely varies based on our pickup location. So where I am, it's a lot of couples in their 30s and early 40s, you know, maybe some small children. Um, In like the near downtown neighborhood, it's some bigger families, and that's where we get more of our like full weekly shares. And then out by the farm, we're actually kind of sandwiched between some pretty wealthy neighborhoods. Um, So then that's a whole different demographic as well, more like retirees. Gotcha. Okay. And then, Lindsay, the name of your farm, how did that come to be? Um, so whistle pig is a colloquial name for, well, a variety of burrowing rodents, depending on where you live, but around here it's, um, the ground squirrels that look like little prairie dogs. And there were a decent number of them on the hill across the street from our farm and come in, you'd hear them whistling to each other. And, um, it's been a great conversation starter at the farmer's market. Mm. Everyone wants to talk yes. about whatever they think a whistle pig is, depending on where they're from. Yes. Yeah, we were down in Colorado a couple of weeks ago, and the uh, I, I think they're the ground squirrels down there. I'm not exactly sure what they were, but they uh, there was just a, an enormous amount. Yeah, they can be a pest. Luckily, we don't get them in the farm. They're more in the sandy hillsides. Yeah. Yeah, I could definitely see how they could. The amount of of soil those things can move could be quite uh, disturbing if they were in the wrong spot. Yeah, well, we have a pocket gophers, which pretty much create the same problem, and they they cause quite a few issues for us. Yeah. All right. So this col- collaborative CSA, obviously, there's other things that are part of a CSA besides producing vegetables. How do you split those? Um, yeah, we've sort of leaned into our respective skill sets and it's not, it's not something we've formalized. Um, we've just been lucky to have a really good working relationship. Um, so I do, like I built our website and I do a lot of like the sales when, during the winter when we're selling CSA shares, do the admin side of that. And then I write our weekly newsletter that we send out to our members. Joe's contribution is a little bit less direct to the CSA and more just the overall operations. He is the one who built our pack shed and um, with his dad's help put up the elk fence and takes on more of those construction-y projects that are out of my wheelhouse. And then he has a slightly bigger burden with pickup staffing as well. Yeah. Gotcha. So, um, Joe, did you have a background in doing like, um, you know, construction or that, or just kind of picked that up? Uh, just kind of picked that up. Uh, my dad's got more construction background, but you know, just try to be handy and figure things out. I mean, that's kind of what I like to do this time of year in the winter and stuff anyways, tinker and build things and, you know, 
kind of got to be jack of all trades sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Gotcha. So then what, with the CSA, what's, what's kind of the share look like that you're delivering? How big is it? Yeah, so we offer two share sizes, one's a bi-weekly and one's a weekly, but they both get the same um, produce uh, each week, so we're not packing two different types of boxes. Um, it's a $40 value, so we just kind of try to hit that, and then we try to make it so it's something you can make a meal with. So we aim to have an allium, an herb, a root vegetable, leafy greens, and then whatever seasonal vegetables. Gotcha. Yeah, we try not to make too many odd vegetables that people don't know too much. Like, don't give them fennel, like, yeah. four weeks in a row. Yeah, and, like and don't do kohlrabi, fennel, and winter savory in the same week. It might blow their minds. Yes, I have learned I now alternate kohlrabi and fennel. Try to give people a choice yes. between the two. But I'm going to force them to like one of them. Yes, okay, so do you and give we, any, any choice? Yeah, we do do that now. We used to pack the boxes in the beginning and stuff, and then we realized it would be a lot easier if we just bring it all and just lay it out on the table like a market. Mm -hmm. And then if we have enough, sometimes we may not have enough of something, so we'll give them a choice mm -hmm. of either or. Or in case maybe we've given them a cabbage last week, maybe they want something different. Or yeah. we try to. Yeah. It's not a totally market style, but we try to include some options. You know, if somebody likes doesn't like kale, they can get chard, or they don't want hot peppers, they can pick sweet peppers, um, different herbs, things like that. Yeah. I know, the holidays aren't even here yet, but it's never too early to start dreaming about your spring planting. At the Farm on Central, you can pre-order willows, elderberries, blackberries, blueberries, ginger and turmeric and more right now to guarantee you have your favorite varieties ready to plant when the planting season rolls around. We've got over a dozen new varieties this year with more being added every day. Whether it's cuttings in February or rooted plants in mid-spring, get ahead of the game and pre-order your spring plants today at shop.farmoncentral.com. That's shop.farmoncentral.com. Have you noticed with like the varieties that you grow, certain varieties do better for you because of how hot your summers are? Oh, absolutely. It's a real challenge, especially on your like summer fruiting crops um, that will withstand the heat and not just drop every single blossom when it's 110 degrees. Yeah. So what's are there any specific varieties that you guys like? Um, peppers is one that really comes to mind because sun scald is such an issue. Yes. Mm -hmm. So Joe's had really good success with some. I use the, the sweet Italian peppers do really well. Okay, um, but I have to put shade cloth over all of them in the winter or the summer uh, to keep them from sun scolding. So you just kind of build like that, a shade house. Yeah, we just make like a makeshift structure over it with shade, and that seems to do the trick. And I got that from another farmer that told me to do that, and it worked. So yeah. Yeah. So when are you typically planting in the spring? Like, let's say your peppers, for example. May. Okay. Peppers are in the May. So our our last frost is I think May tenth. Oh wow. Okay. So usually the peppers we push to the very last week of May and then we plant them. Gotcha. Yeah, we continue to get pretty cold nights until late May, early June. Um, and so that's usually when we start getting nights around fifty and we can put out those eggplant peppers. Tomatoes yes. we'll put in a little bit earlier. Yeah, tomatoes because of the greenhouse I can put them in I think I usually go into April's. Okay. And then with like the peppers, do you go ahead and row cover them for the first bit or? Uh, usually we're pretty good by that point. Okay. Weather wise. Um, that's why I wait the extra couple weeks. Gotcha. <laughs> Saves the step. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And then the, the markets you go to, how big are those? Uh, it's quite a big market. The Boise farmer's market. I think it's been voted number one or two market. It's a pretty big market. Um, I don't know about this year, but we've both been on the board. I think last year they were averaging like uh, 250000 in sales a month or something like that. It's over $2 million a year or something like that. Gotcha. Um, so is that something where you have to report your your sales every week or they just get a, a like a recommendation or a survey from you at the end of the year? 
Uh, they do. We do report sales. That's part of the. Yeah, every week. You have to part of your membership. So, do you also have to pay percentage of sales, or they just want to know? They just want to know. Um, okay, for marketing purposes. For, for probably, yeah. purposes. Yeah. I think it's for like getting grants and things like that. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. There is. Uh, I don't know where if it's more common in certain places rather than others, but there are certain markets that do charge percentage, and I, I don't know. I think that's um, can be a good thing um, if as long as what they're charging is going being plowed directly back into the market. Yeah, they considered that, um, but I think ultimately we decided that it's just incentivizing incentivizing people to not be honest about their sales, and you know, there's and better ways to do tiered. Costs, I think we're also an ag focused market and producer only market, which is yes. kind of a big deal. Mm -hmm. So you have to have 51% of the members have to be agriculture or else it can't expand to other vendors. Okay. How many which vendors are the, Yeah. How many vendors are there approximately? I think it ranges from like 70 ish to 90 ish. Okay. Interesting. Okay. And then how many vendors do you think there are there? I mean, in the peak summer, there's well over 95 okay. vendors. Uh, Farm-wise, well, it's obviously 50, over 51%, but we have a, we also have a, we have a lot of refugee farmers that farm in the summer too, which pushes up the numbers as well for our market in the summer. So we have gotcha more farmers in yeah and then we have a lot of ranchers in idaho ranchers. as well so i feel like a lot of other places there's not as much meat representation at the okay. market um we have a lot of ranchers and yeah i guess that vendors. was yeah i guess that was kind of trying to figure out the breakdown of what that looks like um and then like do you have i'm assuming you have like bakers that sort of thing as well mm -hmm. yeah 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 and then for like this specialty value added products they're required to use locally sourced ingredients in what they're selling at market okay cool so talk a little bit about kind of like uh your two different farms you're in a joint csa how does like the decision making process work how do you figure things out honestly pretty fly by the seat of our pants a lot of times and it's just worked for us really well okay. like we just come together on monday and we're like what do you have what do you have and that's worked well for us. And I think we both just um, have confidence in the other person to be accountable uh -huh. to that. And there hasn't been any issues. Um, and we do have some conversations in winter about what we're growing. And so gotcha. doing some planning there. Yeah. So you're not, um, not completely, you know, mirroring each other. So do either of you have employees? Are you both running this solo? Uh, no employees at the moment, but that might have to change. <laughs> gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. It's intimidating to take that step, figuring out the red tape and how, how much time do you need an employee? What can you pay them? And, you know, the cost of living here in Boise has gone up pretty dramatically in the past five years. And so... Mm -hmm. affording someone, especially if you only need someone for, you know, 10, 20 hours a week, um, paying them something that's worth it for them is it's yeah. intimidating so, to figure all that out. Yeah. You might do better with like a, a CSA member that's wanting to trade for food or for exercise. Yeah. yeah. Or we've considered, um, figuring out how to share an employee. You know, we can, mm. if we both have, needs for someone but neither is you know a lot of hours or there's another vegetable farm across the street from us that always has some they have some full-time employees some part-time um so potentially working out an arrangement there gotcha. we're both getting gotcha. to the point okay. where we need if we want to grow we need extra hands yeah what would each of you say is the hardest part of growing in your environment the heat yeah the heat. It was. I think this year we had in so, July like two days in the 95. Not, that was it. Yeah. I planted my fall cabbage when it's 107 degrees. Um, oh, wow. And so it was over 100 for a pretty good chunk of the summer. And then it was also extremely smoky from wildfires for that same time. So you're just. It's really hard on your body to be working out in that. Oh. Yeah. Yes. 
Absolutely. And we noticed we yeah, got yeah. some worse pollination because of all the smoke with certain things. So, mm-hmm. Yeah, it affects the yields quite a bit. Especially squash. So do you think it was the bees were just not flying or? Well, I'm not 100% sure, but I was reading stuff about it can affect their navigation or something. Yeah, so a lot of pollinators rely on UV to navigate, but with mm. the smoke kind of dulling everything out, um, they can't navigate as well, and they're also less active in the heat. And we tend to get both of those things at the same time. Gotcha. Yes. Yeah. Because when it's hot enough, then you get the fires, and now that generates the smoke, and so now it's, yeah, spirals out of control. Yeah. And like, it doesn't, last year, I don't think we had one day in the triple, so it's hard to sometimes we get lucky. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we typically max out around 92 to 95. So we just, that triple digits, we just, we don't understand anything about that. Yeah. Yeah. But then we do yeah, it's get. That's not something you can avoid here. Uh, yes. I get anything you want to work in it. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Um, um, but then we do have the, you know, minus 10 degrees in the wintertime too, which is, is really no fun. Yeah. We luckily yeah. don't get that. Share a little bit about um, kind of your your marketing to the customers with the CSA. How do you kind of approach that uh, of, of pulling in new customers and kind of sharing the st- story? Yeah, I think a big benefit of us both being at the farmer's market is it's a great way to get yourself out there because um, you have a – your customer base is coming to you. And so that's sort of how we both started out. Um and then got our first customers, you know, with the markets being closed. From there, we kind of leaned on Instagram. But that's been less useful recently. And so kind of figuring out the best way to move forward. I think right now we're mostly growing our CSA through word of mouth from our existing customers. Um, and then like our newsletter has been good and so I'll also collect like prospect emails through that and do some advertising that way in the lead up to yeah. CSA. Uh, do you season. feel like you get them through your farmer's market because you're still doing that, correct? We both still do the farmer's market. I think for the most part, okay. farmer's market customers are farmer's market customers yeah. and they're not really looking to join a CSA, but maybe some of those more casual shoppers who come through. Um, a lot of people who like, I think, the CSA, too, they don't, they're pretty outdoorsy folks, so they're, okay. like, usually leaving on the weekends, because uh, we have a lot of out- outdoor activities around here, so I think that there's different types of customers in that regard, so the CSA tends to, of course, families and people who are busy on the weekends. Yeah. Uh, and then our market customers, we get, like, they come every weekend. Yeah. This is what they it's do. an event for them. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so as we're looking to grow the CSA, trying to figure out how to reach those people who aren't at the market um, and maybe aren't super engaged in social media of the local farms has been sort of the question. And I yeah. think the biggest challenge, probably with a lot of CSAs, is a lot of people still don't know what a CSA is. Correct. Even people who go to the market a lot don't know. So it's kind of like, it's an education thing, I think is a big barrier. Yeah. And so do you, uh, you do use the word CSA. Is that something you, pre- you very heavily feature? Just keep talking about the CSA concept. You know, I try to mix up the language when I am advertising to capture people who don't see CSA and know what that means. So I'll say like local farm shares when I'm doing like social media ads, um, or hanging flyers because yeah, I think, trying to fit CSA and then explain what CSA is, you're going to lose people's attention before you Mm -hmm. really get the point across. Yeah. Um, What would you say each of your favorite crops is to grow? Uh, Mine's probably going to be garlic, I think. (laughs) Okay. I just like everything about it. I just like the whole growing process. Although my body hurts right now while I'm planting it. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, I get the most joy out of the garlic, I think. I really enjoy growing the Asian greens. Um, it's sort of the niche I've made for myself at our market. 
and then it, you get a great price for them with less post-harvest work than a lot of the other greens like lettuce mixes and spinach. Correct. Um, you know, something like bok choy is just a dunk and go. Yeah. You don't have to spin dry and all that. So what's, what do you, how do you recommend folks use those greens? Yeah, definitely a big educational component. Um, for something like bok choy, I usually just encourage people to start with like just a little steaming with some garlic and ginger. Um, or telling people that they can barbecue it has been a great pitch for bok choy. And I do like the little Shanghai baby mm-hmm. bok choy. Yes. I've, I've been branching out and as I sort of have my reputation for myself at the market, adding some weirder things in and getting people to try it. Um, so I've been growing chrysanthemum greens for a couple of years. Okay. And this is the first year where I really had people come in and buying me out of it. Yeah. Um, instead of just really the educational part. And how do folks typically prepare those? So a lot of people who buy them just eat them raw in salads. It's sort of like a bitter component. Like you might use arugula. Okay. But it's really great in like hot pot um, or there's some like salads where you steam it and then make like a dressing with like toasted sesame seeds, soy sauce, that kind of deal. Yeah. And then Joe, talk a little about the garlic. Do you have a favorite variety? Well... That is a continuing thing. So I just got some new varieties this year. So in Idaho, we're in a unique situation with garlic. Uh, you can't get garlic seed outside the state of Idaho. We're on a strict quarantine, so you have to get it sourced from somebody certified in the state. No, actually, within a couple of counties in the state. Yeah, too. within a couple of counties. Um, so this year, I'm excited to do the Korean red, which I've planted. Yeah. Um, okay, so... That what... was the my... Li- I got a lot of soft necks, so I'm getting more into the hard necks now. And all my garlic, I had to get from, like, a neighbor, the neighbor across the street who grows a lot more garlic than me. Um, So it takes time to get, like, a lot of seed built up if you don't sell it too much. (laughs) Correct, yeah. What is the disease that they are worried about? Or White rot. White rot. Okay. But it also means we have people want our garlic seed outside of our state, too, because they know there's such strict control gotcha okay so yeah you it can, goes like 24 dollars a pound here for seed so you can sell it out of the state you just can't bring it into the state correct, correct. so if you want to bring like a new variety into the state you have to get every clove individually inspected and pay for that inspection oh wow all right how much is the inspection i, I don't know <laughs> it just seems like a headache so yeah i get it from a certified grower in the state and it's yeah. pretty easy to get it certified if you grow it in state. They just come out yeah. four or five times and check. But. Okay. Yeah. Check everything. Um, what would you say is um, your advice to beginning growers? Invest in your infrastructure, like you're getting a cooler and all your post-harvest stuff because it really bottles next there, you know. Yeah, I think for me, I would say not taking on too much. I think people get excited and they want to grow all the crops they're interested in or maybe have some animals too, and it's just really easy to get overwhelmed. Um, You know, I started with a pretty short list of crops, and I'm glad I did because I was able to get good at those and then add more in once I sort of got the hang of things. Gotcha. Yeah, no, I think that's good advice as well. Well, thank you both so much, Lindsay and Joe, for coming on today. Appreciate you sharing about the CSA, how you guys have that set up, and uh, hearing how farming is in your area of the country. Yeah, it's been great talking. Great talking to you. Thanks. Thanks for having us. Absolutely. So there you have it, another episode in the books. So I'd love if you would hop on over to iTunes and leave us a rating and a review. Those mean everything to us. We love to hear what you're thinking. If you have a podcast guest that you can recommend, please pop on over to the Thriving Farmer podcast website and leave us a review. That's thrivingfarmerpodcast.com.